The year is 1998. I press eject on my Iowa 5-disc CD changer and remove Gangstar's moment of truth, because Chris just got a 5-disc CD changer in his car, and I'm going to reach into the most awkward part of his trunk to remove that 5-disc CD changer and put this CD in the 5-disc CD changer, because everyone knows Militia Bumps in the Whip. As I effortlessly slide into a pair of Jinko jeans, I check for the three double-stacked Mitsubishis sitting firmly tucked in my stash pocket. I drape myself in a crisp new FUBU jersey, not even remotely recognizing the appropriation. Towel stuffed under the door, I take a long and mighty twack off the ashy resin that dwells within the depths of cold steel and wire. With one last glance at my sorry teenage attempt at a pencil beard, I don my red-fitted Yankees cap, lace up my airwalks, and turn off the blacklight. Tonight, I go to my first rave. 1999 was a vividly transformative year for American culture. As the now valueless currency accumulated over the past 30 years through aggressive military manipulation and violence was feverishly spent by criminally deregulated corporations, whew, the internet, a system of communication built by its users and definitely not Bill Gates, found its way into millions of homes. As kids literally began to be left to their own devices by working parents, new trends began to emerge that would lay the foundation for the next millennium. The stage was set for the resistance to take hold when on January 1st, the United Nations announced 1999 as the International Year of Older Persons? Oh fuck, never mind, this video's over. The soundtrack to the revolution was triumphantly scored when future collaborators and underground pioneers MF Doom, Peanut Butter Wolf, and Mad Lib all released seminal albums, and their impact on hip-hop and music as a whole would be felt. Uh, 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 would, would be felt for... What the... F what... What's would be felt for genera- oh no. As the Barbie doll celebrated its 40th year of teaching women impossible beauty standards, and the president was caught up in a trial questioning his relationships with impressionable young women, Britney Spears came onto the scene in January 1999 and single-handedly created incel culture. The schoolgirl aesthetic, long stares into the camera and seductive vocal fry simultaneously excited and alienated men of all ages, a perfectly marketed blend of unattainable purity and taboo desire. It also cemented the career of Max Martin, who would go on to polish turds, rake in cash, and hand out scraps to victims of predatory corporations like Katy Perry, Maroon 5, and Taylor Swift. Britney would go on to be abused by her parents and management team for 20 years, having numerous nervous breakdowns and ultimately no control over her life, while being criticized for having no talent and ruining music. It was creepy as fuck, and nobody blinked an eye. Also, Michael Jordan retired, again, assumingly not for gambling on his own team this time. Probably didn't know that, did ya? February saw an equally tumultuous exchange on the cultural battlefield. With the help of manager and pure evil wrapped in ham Lou Pearlman, NSYNC released their third single and continued to gain steam. Eminem would release his major label debut, the Slim Shady LP, and instantly brought credibility to white rappers, while offering racists an opportunity to be a part of modern pop culture without adjusting their ever-so-nuanced views on equality. Meanwhile, conscious hip-hop made its way back to the mainstream with two aptly titled releases, The Roots, Things Fall Apart, with its strikingly political cover, and Lauryn Hill's neo-soul magnum opus, The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill, which swept the Grammys but left the rapper-slash-singer pioneer burnt out by the industry within a year. After the former Fuji gave songwriting credits on two songs to Che Guevara himself, she removed herself from the spotlight, having this to say. There were many temptations, enticements, entrapments. Whether it was the dependence on image or just some false sense of security I created from such a sincere, pure place. But those enticements produced a very toxic situation for my creativity, my person. You don't know how to handle that in a diplomatic matter, especially when everyone around you has been affected by the money, the fame, the attention. People need to understand that Lauren Hill they were exposed to in the beginning was all that was allowed in that arena at that time. There was much more strength, spirit, and passion, desire, curiosity, ambition, and opinion that was not allowed in a small space designed for consumer mass appeal. I had to step away when I realized that for the sake of the machine, I was being way too compromised. I thought it was okay for me to write a song about something complicated if I was going through something complicated. But I discovered people could only acknowledge red and blue, and I was somewhere in between. I was purple. 
I had to fight for an identity that doesn't fit in one of their boxes. One take! Also, a great movie about a man transcending fear to spit in the face of his corporate overlords, ultimately finding himself working for another set of corporate overlords, but you know, that's not the point, is released to minimal fanfare. March 1999 found the music industry charging an additional eight cents for pieces of plastic that only cost a fraction of a cent to make, while creating the decadent new diamond certification level for record sales. Because they can only go up from here, right? <laughs> this now laughable move coincided with boundary-pushing releases from the Dropkick Murphys, Roots Maneuver, Mr. Wazo, Aphex Twin, Fugazi, People Under the Stairs, and Anti-Flag. Oh and Ricky Martin. Beyond the cookie-cutter look and bland pop stylings, it's worth noting that Martin paved the way for Hispanic artists in the mainstream, and created a dialogue that helped Americans recognize that we're in fact living on stolen land, and should respect any and all immigr- <laughs> No, that part didn't happen. They get put in cages now! Also put in a cage was Jack Kevorkian, who, if allowed to continue his business of assisted suicide, would have become the richest doctor in all the world. Oh god, please let me out of this meat suit right now! Luckily, two trans witches channeled the most revolutionary story of our time and managed to get it released in theaters worldwide by putting a bunch of kick-ass stunts in it, planting the seed of transcendent anarcho-transhumanism in every person who witnessed it. Unfortunately, they never made any sequels to this film. April found us right in the midst of, oh god damn it! The Violator Without Makeup returned once again with yet another obnoxious boy band, the Backstreet Boys. Blink-182 tried to make fun of them and ended up being forced to play the same terrible songs over and over well into their 40s. Nas recruits Puff Daddy, fresh off an Illuminati sacrifice, to help him show off his newly discovered narcissism. Yes, he really crucifies himself in the video. In film, Reese Witherspoon manages to play two completely different types of deranged white people to much critical acclaim. Then, there was Columbine. The shooting was not the first of its kind, but it was the most violent, and set a precedent in media and amongst parents across the country. Music, video games, and absolutely nothing else were the cause of this violence, and someone was going to pay. Disregard the idea of an entire generation of insanely negligent parents and the evidence of ties to a neo-Nazi group that regularly planned and enacted fake shootings online for years leading up to the event. To be perfectly honest, when I first heard about Columbine, my first thought was, I get it. The rage, the repression, the constant assurance that all of this is okay with no inclination that anyone is having a great go of it. I even wore a trench coat to school in some kind of morbid solidarity. Certainly kept the bullies away for a while. Didn't know about the Nazi stuff though, Whew, my bad. The reality is, is that I was not very different from those kids. I had friends who kept napalm in their locker and liked Pantera a little more than Marilyn Manson or Nine Inch Nails. First time I saw a gun was in my friend's attic bedroom. I'm pretty sure he was on coke at the time. My high school sweetheart carved the word failure into her forearm. On many occasions, I took a week's worth of Depakote with a heavy pour of Jim Beam to start my night. I'm just saying I get it. Let me know if you need to talk. By May, we were ready for some positivity. Not like this. Smash Mouth's All-Star was released on May 4th, 1999, and changed the musical world as we know it in an instant. The unofficial theme song of the star-studded flop Mystery Men seamlessly weaved vague social consciousness with a Chuck E. Cheese aesthetic, hired a DJ, and called it a career. It is the quintessential symbol of the wokeness of the time, a neoliberal ode to having fun, getting paid, and enjoying the world being on fire? What the fuck? The Dow Jones broke 11,000 for the first time ever, an obvious sign that America's infrastructure was only gonna get stronger in the coming years. Yeah. At least we got Spongebob. Raucous Records Sound Bombing 2 and Slick Rick's The Art of Storytelling are just amazing. I don't have any jokes about this stuff, I just really enjoy them. Oh wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. Something about a Star War and Fantomas? I, I don't know. I wasn't really paying attention to the ads. It didn't seem like that big of a deal. I'm sure an indulgent egomaniac didn't ruin a fictional safe space for a generation of people or anything. Speaking of rebel forces, Napster was an integral part of democratizing and ultimately pointing a collective middle finger at the music industry. On top of that, the peer-to-peer -peer system has proven to be a vital tool in the dissemination of subversive and countercultural knowledge, exposing a generation of computer geeks and now the general public to ideas rarely discussed outside of clandestine meetings and ancient grimoires. That also includes intensely violent neo-Nazi propaganda, like the kind Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold were both referencing and creating years before they attacked their school. Two albums your narrator did not download from Napster between jerk-off sessions were the Red Hot Chili Peppers' Californication and Limp Bizkit's Significant Other. The first is easy to understand. 
Its tired, soft emo pop that rips the funk straight from Flea's hands, trades Dave Navarro's distorted sex godhood for now sober John Frusciani's adult contemporary noodling, and just desperately tries to recreate Under the Bridge over and over. Fuck that album. The second can only be understood with an unbiased listen to Limp Bizkit's incredibly unique and dynamic 1997 debut release, Three Dollar Bill Yo. The raucous blend of hardcore punk, hip-hop, and screamo is surprisingly enjoyable to listen to, and is one of the few highlights of the rap metal genre, free from the vapid lyrical content, played-out riffs, and ironic self-plagiary the band is now known for. Fred Durst wrote a great song about people copying a style just to be popular on their first album, and then just literally did a bad impression of himself on the second, and openly says he did it off the nookie and the lead fucking single. What the fuck? Lance Armstrong came into the spotlight during the 1999 Tour de France, winning by a landslide of needles and lies. This would turn out to be the beginning of the end of the steroid era, as news of dirty top-tier players from all major sports spread throughout the media over the next decade. Except basketball, of course, where the best player of all time mysteriously retired in his prime, switched sports like he lost a bet or something, just to come back two years later and easily break almost every record in the league. Tommy Chong was the first person to receive a medical cannabis card in America, slowly releasing the vicious grip the government has had on plant medicines for then nearly 30 years. In film, we saw abstract philosophical works that depicted manipulation and illumination at the highest levels, with Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut, lo-fi DIY experimentation with the Blair Witch Project, and next level whatever the fuck this was that was apparently very influential with American Pie. And then there is the masterpiece that is Deep Blue Sea. You know what, this movie just needs its own video, we're gonna do that separate. After the success of Woodstock 94... Wait, really? With the mud and the bad performances? The one where they sold 164,000 tickets, but 550,000 people showed up? Oh, uh, oh, success just means making a bunch of money for oligarchs at that point? Oh, okay, I see. Corporations were chomping at the bit to get their grubby little fingers on Woodstock 99. The festival featured overpriced water, sexual assault, and flag burning. It lacked a laundry list of popular black artists, security, and a sense of decency. Truly a libertarian's dream. Amongst the terrible lineups, Cheryl Crow, DMX, and The Offspring? Everclear, Ice Cube, and Los Lobos? Oh, Jesus Christ! Aggressive bonfires and football field-sized mosh pits of future Proud Boys, it's interesting to note the immediate disdain many of the acts had for the audience. This is sort of a take-your-top-off kind of day? Is that what it is? Between the overwhelming heat and each band's growing sense of showmanship, many performances do successfully stoke the unruly aggression of the crowd. Let's be honest, they saw the ticket prices, a paltry sum compared to festivals of today, might I add. These weren't the kids that knew the lyrics and the drummer's name. They were the assholes that picked on the weird kids that would become those artists. One by one, each artist seemed to be figuring out the same thing in gruesome real time. It just wasn't about the music. How you doing, all you rich motherfuckers? There's so much to unpack here. It's quite literally a cringe fest, and every performance is available in its entirety on YouTube. I could make a video about each one, and I just might, but this is a real highlight. I can't even bring myself to play the audio. I'm about to vomit from cringing so hard. Just go check out the beginning of the DMX performance if you want the worst 90s cringe you've ever 90s cringed in your fucking godforsaken 90s life. Holy shit, that was depressing. Okay, what else we got? Um, yeah, the, what, the, the Sixth Sense came out? Not really revolutionary, but okay. Yet another creation of Bullfrog with Botox, Lou Pearlman is released on the public, and Christina Aguilera? God damn it. Can we just do a fourth wall break where I audibly ponder how I'm going to make it through the rest of this video? I I'm, I'm doing that right now, and I've used this bit where I talked to the fake producer already. Oh, okay, fine. What else? Hmm, something that really encapsulates the audacious amounts of money being thrown around by media conglomerates. 
Uh, something that just spits in the face of education, maybe, and the pursuit of truth. Who wants to be a millionaire? This train wreck of intellectualism single-handedly placed illusions of grandeur in the minds of Americans that found Jeopardy too pretentious while showing off how small a sum one million dollars was becoming to those in power. One million dollars! <laughs> It also managed to squeeze considerable ad revenue out of contestants literally sitting in silence while dramatic music played. No wonder the profits seem endless. If you need a palate cleanser at this point, go check out the High and Mighty's Home Field Advantage and what I consider Nine Inch Nails' best and most adventurous album, The Fragile. As the Kosovo War ended, which I imagine had nothing to do with socialism, unimpeachable rapist and pedophile Bill Clinton made one last gesture pretending he cared about the American population with his gun buyback program. This, juxtaposed with increasing reports of violence in rural schools and churches, would focus primarily on metropolitan areas, while motivating many legal gun owners to double down on a growing, vitriolic hatred for liberals and anybody trying to take away the freedoms acquired over the past 400 years. The weekend of September 11th, 1999 saw the release of both Fight Club and American Beauty, two films detailing the growing existential dread in America from very different perspectives. Both depict an imaginative protagonist, brought down by the way things are and have to be because that's just how the greatest country on the planet works, damn it! A reclamation of lost glory, and triumphant virtue signaling that white guys have it pretty rough too. Kevin Spacey won an Academy Award for acting like he likes young girls, and people thought Chuck Palahniuk was a good writer. Bob. Bob had bitch tits. It was a strange time indeed. Method Man and Red Man's Blackout came out though, as did Black Alicia's Nia. Those are dope. As most deaths, Black on Both Sides offered a very different vision of hip-hop than what the Bling era attempted to produce. The movie Three Kings quietly ignored convention, and in its place created an allegory for General Smedley Butler's infamous War is a Racket for the mainstream. Oh yeah, somewhere in between was this. Assisted perhaps by a series of abysmal releases by the King of Bling Puff Daddy, the stage was set for conscious music to regain ample ground in the pop landscape. On November 2nd, fresh off the first Coachella festival, Rage Against the Machine released what I consider their most focused and accessible collection of work, The Battle of Los Angeles. The album's bright production and catchy, danceable riffs added sheen to the band's final product without wiping away any of the grime. However, Rage's time on the top was short-lived, as the next two years would see the band going from storming the New York Stock Exchange during a Michael Moore-produced music video, to being the only artist having their entire catalog mentioned in the infamous 2001 Clear Channel Memorandum on questionable content in media after 9-11. We saw inaugural releases from future rap luminaries Tech 9 and 17-year-old Lil Wayne. Oh man, look at that album cover! <laughs> the Roots returned with one of the best live albums ever, Come Alive, Q-Tip released his solo debut, and a personal favorite of mine came out, the Beat Chunkies Volume 3 mixtape. Kevin Smith's dogma slid in right before Christmas to poke fun at white America's consumerism and blind idol worship, and provided us yet another example of artists using fame to inject a deeper message into the mainstream. Also, a guy who used to whisper rap over dance beats I'm Dr. Dre, gorgeous hunk of a man. and wear a purple patent leather surgical mask put out an album that... Looking back, would have fit in pretty well with the aggression and misogyny at Woodstock. It's kind of one long ode to being an asshole, scored by this guy and written by this guy, and okay, this guy's pretty cool, but you get my point. I mean, the guy made Express Yourself. Okay, sure, Q wrote it, but... As unheard of headlines like Clinton pledges help for porous nations found their way onto phony copies of the Seattle Post-Intelligencer... Great name, too bad it's a CIA rag like the rest of them. Anarchists and revolutionary sympathizers took to the streets to protest the World Trade Organization Conference. Police would violate Fourth Amendment rights to silence them, eventually paying $250,000 in a civil suit to the 157 individuals arrested, and forcing police chief Norm Stamper to resign. This protest shed light on globalism in the mainstream for the first time, and provided a foundation for Occupy Wall Street and the Great Revolution of 2020. 
Films like Girl Interrupted and Man on the Moon showed us how exciting, enigmatic personalities can often come with extensive personal baggage, while Magnolia and Any Given Sunday portrayed the lonely, despicable lives of those who choose to manipulate humanity for their own financial gain. As Nas made extra sure he came out with the worst rap album of the year, Jay-Z dropped Legendary Volume 3, featuring unforgettable production from the likes of DJ Premier and Timbaland, and introducing the world to southern rap legends UGK. It was a blend of underground street emceeing and lavish pop rap that would shape the next decade of music. Hey listen, I'm a Nas guy too, but it is what it is. Finally, after a series of conflicts with neighboring countries in the US that I have no business explaining to anyone, Russian President Boris Yeltsin resigned totally under his own will, appointing totally not corrupt Vladimir Putin as his totally cool and totally normal successor. That worked out great for everyone. What is this video about? Control. 1999 was a computer-generated dream world, built to keep us under control, in order to change a human being into this. Hold on, sorry, that just happens sometimes. Uh, okay, fine, let's do it! Nineteen ninety nine was about control, but also freedom. At least the perception of freedom. We saw creative energy that was openly more focused on commerce than art, leaving even the purest artists tired and disillusioned. The gritty, careless appeal of nineties culture was getting a spit shine, and with it came a level of posturing and ego the likes of which we have never seen. Now, as the collective has suffered considerable PTSD at its own hand for twenty years, we can see what this kind of hubris does to our nation our culture, our planet. Where we go from there is a choice I leave to you.